What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Monday, September 9th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, oil majors and traders vie for Shell's South African assets. Next up, Trump pledges to scale back use of sanctions. Interesting. Next up, a fight is brewing over Chinese money in Norway. They're everywhere, folks. Next up, UK's <laughs> car makers face gargantuan fines for not selling enough EVs. That's an interesting tongue twister right there. And then finally, it's spreading. America's top oil field terrorized by armed Venezuelan gangs. Stu will then turn over to me. I will quickly cover what's happening in the oil and gas markets. We, we saw some interesting stuff happen on Friday relative to where prices went. I'll opine a little bit of where I think things will go this week. We'll quickly touch on rig counts and then quickly talk about Crescent Energy needing to do a quick $250 million private placement to fund a recent acquisition. So it's not getting any better for everyone else out there, folks. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's start with a little, little tiny company called Shell. Oil majors, traders vie for Shell's South African assets. Michael, do you remember when the Shell and BP started selling off all their oil stuff and they started going to renewables? Yep. I I'm not sure that they're done being stupid yet. Shell is divesting from its downstream operations in South Africa, attracting interest from major oil traders, Saudi Aramco, DNOC, Trafigura, and many other are looking to play in this ball game. Michael, let's take a look here. Shell said earlier this year it's preparing to divest from downstream operations in South Africa as a result of their internal portfolio review. So this is really looking at the gas stations downstream stream and taking a look in that total area. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I wouldn't read too much into this as they're trying to move into renewables. They clearly came out and said that they're going to continue to hold a majority interest in the or uh, they're going to retain all of their upstream assets, which and right. they're even planning on drilling an ultra deep water well there. So right. that's big bucks there. You know, Shell and BP have come out recently and sort of done a 180 on the whole renewables thing. I think this is what you're seeing is it's it, it's becoming harder and harder to be as vertically integrated. Exxon's of the world, the Chevron's, yeah. it's hard to own upstream, downstream, and midstream and make them all profitable because they all right. run on different stuff. You know, technical expertise becomes a thing. If you can't do upstream right, why are you trying to do downstream right? So I it, think yeah. this is a little bit, this I'll take at a little bit more face value of what they're saying is a little bit of a right sizing. I think it's interesting the companies who are interested in purchasing it, Saudi Aramco being one of them. I was Oil wondering company. about your opinion on that. Uh, yeah. Abby, Oman Trading, and then also Trafigura. We know Trafigura is big in the South in, in, in South Africa, specifically with their Puma Energy organization. They're also, yeah. we did see that the largest gas station network, EGEN, was sold last year to Vito Energy, which is a subsidiary of one of the world's largest oil traders, Vito. So there is a little bit of precedent here for some of these larger oil traders to come right. in. We've seen a lot of these independent traders been trying to snap up all of these different refineries, mainly so that they can, you know, as part of what, you know, this article would say is a quote, strategic portfolio realignment. Basically, if you can g gain direct access relative to your markets, you have an easier chance of going and setting up and, and shipping your crude and have an ability to kind of make those margins look better. So I think it's, it's, it's in their best, these traders best interest though. I think when you're bidding against Saudi Aramco, yeah, it's tough. Yeah. Ruh -ruh. Hey, let's take a look at Trump here. Trump pledges to scale back sanctions about time. Economic curbs imposed on the U S by other countries are harming the dollar. The Republican candidate just said, about time. Some I want to use sanctions as little as possible, explaining there's a problem with the extensive reliance on such penalties by the U.S. Ultimately, it kills your dollar and kills everything the dollar represents. Holy smokes, I wish the Biden... We can only hope Kamala reads this and wants to do the same. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and at least he, he, he goes on to note this. He was a big user of sanctions in his first term. But, and, but, but they were more strategic. 
Well, okay, one man's strategic action is another person's world. Well, world. Let, me, let me explain this. When you make that comment, I'm going to say this. Iran was strategically, surgically sanctioned, and they were busted and broke. Then you had the weaponization and the sanctions under the Biden administration and under the Biden-Harris administration. They did not enforce the sanctions, and they obliterated all these sanctions everywhere, and the Iran got rich. So be careful how you phrase that one. I, I just there, there's always, you know, the, the, the one thing that I think President Trump that I like about him is the fact that he's willing to change his mind. I mean, exactly. we can all acknowledge that his foreign policy in his first term wasn't great. I mean, it, 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 we can admit that, but yes. the beautiful part is he's willing to change his mind, and this is a great learning lesson. I mean, he involved. I mean, he had John Bolton in his staff, nonetheless. You oh. can't, you can't tell me John Bolton isn't part of the deep state, okay? Oh, you know, John Bolton. All the should... other people he had in in his staff. Okay, so all I'm saying is the beautiful yeah. part is that he's willing to change his mind, and I think this is a great step to say, look, I use sanctions. Yeah, they right. were strategic, but I also now see the importance of allowing. And really what he's talking about is the is the strength of the dollar. If I exactly. love this quote here. If we lose the dollar as the world's currency, I think it would be the equivalent of losing a war. And that would make us a third world country and we cannot let it happen. So I love that. Now, I also love Robert F. Kennedy Jr. when he said that Trump and had a personal discussion with him and said Trump made a lot of mistakes and he's going to be a different guy this time because everybody was throwing people at him to put in places like Bolton that should have never been anywhere near power. We can so, only hope. We can only hope. We can only hope. Hey, All right, what's next? Let's go to China. Our buddies up there in Norway. A fight is brewing over Chinese money in Norway. This one is really pretty much, there's about three other sub stories in this one. And that is the Arctic Reach, this little town up in there, the, the good old days of globalization in Norway, for some reason, a small town needs an investor and a piece of infrastructure. Costco is really looking at this for Churg Jorgensen, the director of the port of Kirk, Kirkenese, Norwegian broadcaster, obtained his message. The Arctic coastal town is located a mere 20 minute drive from Russia. And its deep water port is 53 nautical miles from Russia's port of Pancheya, making it a potentially critical site in any conflict with Moscow. This is around the Arctic to LNG, which is just down the road, you know, where they're, they, they got their LNG shipments going on. Holy smokes, this is, even though this is over a port, it's port infrastructure, but it's got natural LNG written all over it. Yeah, I mean, this is a, you know, I love this. It's back to the good old days of globalization in Norway. I love it. it's, a, it's a good quote there. I think it's interesting. Clearly, China is attempting to use their influence economically in ways that not only benefit other countries, but ultimately, again, benefit them because they strike a lot of these deals that on the surface, well, it's great for Norway. What's the downside? Well, the downside is they're going to call on you when the time is necessary to use that infrastructure. Oh, in fact, they make the Sopranos look like a teddy bear. Hey, 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 you owe me. Uh, OK, I'm not. Let's go on to the next one. Electric cars in the UK. Tesla, let's say UK car makers face gargantuan fines for not selling enough EVs. You can't. You, I mean, OK, the UK. Answer me this. If you make a lot of profits, you get a windfall profit tax. If you don't sell enough, then you get a gargantuan fine. The 15,000 fine on the non EV sales was first introduced, introduced by the conservative government last year. Keir Stammer's new Labor government then pledged to reinstate the 2030 as the date by sales of new petrol and diesel cars will be banned altogether, reversing the five-year concession by the Tories. I don't get them. I do not understand what's going on over in the UK. Well, I mean, I I'm not going to pretend to know what's going on in the UK Anyway, I'm glad to say I'm not living there. Again, it's interesting. Obviously, that windfall profits tax was specifically on upstream oil and it, gas. Like, it was, but, but they're 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 these rules. You know, you, this EV fine that they're talking about, which you know, let's I mean, let's break it down. A fifteen thousand dollar fine on non EV sales was first introduced by who? 
The conservatives, conservatives. not too conservative, but no, they um, they tubed UK. <laughs> no, they did, and then they pulled the ejector seat and bounced, and now are able. I mean, it's it's pretty unbelievable what they've got here, you know. And then they've destroyed the grid with their energy policies. Yep. So their energy grid is going to be so expensive. One of our other stories was covering about how all of the people that are in retirement are leaving the country and coming back in boats so they can pretend to be illegals coming into the country so they can get free energy. That's what that's my plan. I'm just going to circle around the border. <laughs> so, all right, what's next? Now, speaking of illegals. Speaking of illegals, it's a, a sp- spreading to America's top oil field terrorized by armed Venezuelans and gangs. Over in a place that you and I, like the Aurora Venezuelans taking over that apartment complex, it's only going to get worse from here as the Biden-Harris administration's disastrous open border policies now come to a neighborhood near you, said we saw armed Venezuelan gangs from Tren de Aguan, members terrorized northern Denver suburb of Aurora, according to the libs of TikTok. Texas-based oil and company issued a memo to employees informing them that the police and the FBI have armed Cuba and Venezuelan migrants are committing thefts in the Permian Basin. Here's the memo. Organized crime activity. And even has a picture of one of the tattoos on there. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 pretty unbelievable what's going on there. I will say this is funny. Now we're getting our news from libs of TikTok from Twitter, which is, you know. Uh, hey, I'll tell you what. I love me some Twitter on, on the news front. Oh, well, trust me. Anybody who follows you on Twitter knows you love Twitter. Holy <laughs> smokes. But no, this is pretty unbelievable. This bulletin that was put out is is pretty unbelievable in terms of, you know, do we know what oil company this was by chance? Yeah. I mean. XTO? No, not XTO. WTX. No, okay. Okay. Well, that stands for West Texas. Is that really the name of the oil company? Oh, I thought it was. My my bad. Just just Uh, wondering. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's West Texas operation areas. Okay, okay, cool. So West Texas. I mean, hey, this is what happens all around the globe. I mean, we know ISIS was making a lot of money by stealing oil from pipelines. It's only a matter of time before this was going to happen here. I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty unbelievable. And, you know, what's nice is here in Texas, they're going to do something about it. And people are armed to be able to do something about it. Right. Well, here's the problem with oil field. Oil field guys, if you're operating as an oil field hand on a on a big rig, guns are not allowed on on facilities or on on drilling sites. However, many carry them in their gun in their trucks. So it would be after hours. Yeah, I mean, still in Texas, trust me, they ain't going to let that happen. I promise you that. You're not going to wait for the Hells Angels to possibly show up and uh, try to evict them? No, (laughs) absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> All right. We hey Michael, are you gonna watch this the the thing Tuesday night, tomorrow night? Oh, the debate? Yeah, I'll be yeah. watching. That's gonna be a hoot. Yeah. I mean it'll be interesting. I don't know how much we're gonna we're gonna learn about either one. I think it's gonna be a lot of bickering back and forth. It'll probably be more lively considering at least Kamala is alive and has a pulse. But it'll be interesting to see. <laughs> what happens on both sides. Again, I think it'll be interesting to see what they talk about in terms of energy policy, because I think that's one of the big things that she has hit on. I'm not of- sure. I'm not sure who I'm going to be rooting for over there. <laughs> no one's got any idea. No, no idea. Who you're, but I think it'll be interesting to see how much time they spend on energy policy because Kamala Harris has really flip-flopped on where she stands on oh. fracking. And I think a lot of people in the oil business are wanting. I mean, that. that I mean, again, the, the, the funny part is you can't ban fracking on private lands. You can only ban it on federal lands. And if you actually do ban fracking, prices actually go through the roof. So right. part of me wonders, yeah, maybe it'd be nice for six months, have $300 oil. We'd all make a decent amount of money, well, and then it'd end up getting repealed because they'd realize, oh, this is a horrible idea. I think the difference is she they're not going to ban fracking. Right. One, because they're just there's people aren't that stupid. They're not. Yeah, they are. They, the, um, the Biden administration banned the LNG exports. And then they had the Chevron deference, and then they appealed when they lost against it so that they could go back, and then they banned more fracking in Alaska on federal land. So, no, they are that stupid. To steel man the, I don't want to, we'll get into finance here, but to steel man the LNG export facility, the case for the ban, I think it's, I don't, I don't agree with it. But if you, I were to steel man it, I would say, why were we shipping our LNG overseas when we should use it here? Well, the Jones Act. 
Jones Act just has to do with not using no. chips. So I, I, I agree. LNG, I think you have no. to let the free market no. decide what's going on. But from a national security perspective, if we're sitting here banging the table saying energy is national security, energy is national security, why are we shipping what could what is our biggest national security thing? Over? Two, it's just a thought. Two reasons. Pipelines and Jones Act. Well, I completely if agree. We, with if you. we had pi- pipelines, we wouldn't have to worry about the Jones Act. Yeah. But because we don't have pipelines and they won't put in pipelines, we can't even sell our own LNG to Boston. No, I complete <laughs> again. That's where again I, I'm just trying to steel man the other side of the argument of like you know, in theory, it's not a horrible idea. The problem is the implementation, and at the end of the day, you have to let the free market do what it does. All right. Let's go ahead and jump in to finance, guys. We've got a lot to talk about. Before we do that, we have to pay the bills. As always, the news and quote-unquote analysis you just heard is brought to you by the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com. I should say, not funded by Russia. We are we have been praising oh, no. Putin for 18 months and not gotten a dime of it. And now we, you come to find out there's they're throwing millions of dollars around to people, and we couldn't get a dollar of that. I mean, we, we, we're 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 loving on a Ramco. We're loving on, and we can't get a dollar from anybody. Whoever our ad people are, fire them, fire them. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. But as always, again, guys, EnergyNewsBeat.com, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do a, I guess, an okay job considering we're not getting any of that Russian money. Um, that website up to speed with everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Um, you can also check us out on Substack, the energynewsbeat.substack.com. Hit that description below for all the links to the timestamps, links to the articles. Also check out investinoil.energynewsbeat.com for access to our exclusive direct working interest program that we are partnering up with Pecos Country Operating and our good friends over at The Crew Truth. Well, let's look at markets here for a second, Stu. Overall, <laughs> S&P 500, not a great day over the weekend. Markets down 1.3% or 1.7 percentage points on the S&P 500, about 2.6 percentage points on NASDAQ. Two-year yields down 2.5 percentage points. Ten-year yields only down a half a percentage point, and mainly due to the fact that we had a pretty mixed U.S. jobs report, U.S. Treasury yields reacting pretty strongly to that. U.S. jobs missing estimates as has become somewhat par for the course. Bitcoin still down. Bitcoin had a pretty bad week. We're down at $54,000, but up about a half a percentage point uh, this weekend. Crude oil on Friday, guys, absolute tumble down $2 or 2 Point four one percentage points down to sixty seven sixty seven does look to open here as we record this Sunday afternoon right before the Broncos game I might add so go donkeys markets do look to open some tear some somewhere around that sixty eight dollar mark but obviously you know pretty 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 massive tumble relative to where we would have expected things Brent oil was down to seventy one eighty five actually held pretty flat on Friday and again a lot of that movement downward was a reaction to that jobs report and, and and again the overall United States economy kind of on 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 stilts from that point. We also saw natural gas did spike a little bit about one percentage points, two dollars and twenty seven cents. Our XOP contract, which is our kind of ENP average of all the oil and gas companies that was down about 1.5 percentage points on the day so not not good all around again big reason down two percentage points on oil and gas mainly due again to the fact that we had some pretty pretty you know mixed jobs report you know while you know we did have a job a drop in the jobless rate we went to about 4.2 percentage points we saw less jobs added than was expected which absolutely hurt it for the week, WTI was down a whopping eight percentage points. Brent was down ten percentage points. Pretty crazy. You know, we're back. If you're reading Reuters on on to you know Chinese oil demand, obviously that's something that could say. We also did see on Thursday U.S. crude stockpiles drop by nine point six million, which is pretty unbelievable. Not or six point nine million barrel draw and prices go down. It's obviously the fundamentals have shifted a little bit, and the speculation on where things are going is not really including stock puts because that's an absolutely incredible job. Remember, we saw that on Thursday mainly right. because we had uh, Monday off. We got a full week coming up here. We also did see rig counts drop. We can go ahead and uh, put the story up there. We saw one rig count or run rig shed week over week with, I think we're going to see a few more of them come up as that, we dip in. Is that the one the Venezuelans picked off? <laughs> yes, it was. It was the one they took over, but we did see a very interesting, you know, very, I would say we're going to see a lot more rigs. I think shed here as, as, as 
companies are now seeing the fact that $65, $67 oil is possible. Right. There's, a, there, there's not as many sixty profitable $65 locations out there as there used to be at least four or five years ago. We also did see uh, the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission announced that U.S. oil or U.S. money managers cut their net long crude futures positions week ending September 3rd. So everyone's kind of lining up to be a little bullish. The only other thing I saw, Stu, is Crescent Energy. I happened to put out an additional $250 million private placement, wow. a senior debt facility, mainly to fund their acquisition of Silverbow, which looking now in the Eagle for looks to be, you know, nothing like buying a gas heavy prospect over the over the turn now where oil price is taking a turn. Uh, they're looking to raise $250 million in that private placement of senior notes, uh, $7.37 million or, or percent on that annualized rate payable and matures on January 15th, 2033. So nothing like having to dip into the debt markets to fund an acquisition. I'm sure that'll look good on the balance sheet, but as always, I'm sure they will get away with it. All right, Stu, what are people watching for this week? I'll tell you what, I'm going to be watching for the uh, Kamal discussion with President Trump. This is going to be a absolute hoot to see. I would not want to be between Kamala and Hillary in the presidency. Yeah, it <laughs> It, I don't it, know. Absolutely. So, all right, guys. Well, with that, I we will let you get out of here, get back to work, start your full week. We appreciate everybody checking us out here on the World's Greatest Podcast. For Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.